Welcome everyone to the second day of the CureOM Patient and Caregiver Mini Symposium. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, I'm so sorry that I'm talking to you through a computer screen um, and that we're not all in person. Um, it has been a long time since we've been able to be in person as a community and I am really looking forward to um, hopefully the spring when we will be able to be in person again. Uh, for those of you who um, I don't know, I'm Sarah Selig, co-founder and director of the Cure Ocular Melanoma Initiative with the Melanoma Research Foundation. And um, for those of you who weren't able to join us for the first day of the meeting yesterday, uh, we will have videos available. Um, we were able to have, I think, a lively and exciting discussion of um, the vision and omni registry efforts in the field. And I think a really um, extensive uh, discussion with um, Cassie Beisel, the advocacy officer at the MRF about advocacy in ocular melanoma. Um, and we will alert you when those videos are available to be viewed. The sessions today are also being recorded um, and you will be able to view these sessions um, later by video as well. It might take us a week or two to get everything set up, but we will let you know when the videos are available. Um, so we are thrilled to um, have a great program today. Um, and we will start with a lot of um, clinical and clinical trials information, which hopefully um, you'll find helpful. I want to remind you that throughout the presentations, you can enter your questions in the Q&A box, which you can find at the bottom of the Zoom screen. So without further ado, um, Let's get started with our first session, which is Dr. Richard Carvajal um, talking about Tibentafusp. Dr. Richard Carvajal is an Associate Professor of Medicine at Columbia University Irving Medical Center, where he serves as both Director of Experimental Therapeutics and Director of the Melanoma Service within the Division of Hematology Oncology. Dr. Carvajal is a talented and dedicated clinician, researcher, and advocate for the ocular melanoma community in the US as well as abroad. And I'm thrilled to be able to welcome him here today to, dig to discuss the exciting new drug showing promise in the ocular melanoma space. Thank you, Dr. Carvajal, for being here, and I will hand it over to you. Ara, thank you so much for the very kind introduction. And again, congratulations on the 10-year anniversary of Cure OM. I think it's been a, an incredible ride and there have been a number of achievements that have really made meaningful differences in the field. So let me just share my screen here. Um, hopefully, can everyone see that? We can, yes, doctor. Fantastic. So, yeah, you know, what I want to do is spend a few minutes talking about um, um, a drug called Tibentafus, which, which to me really represents what I would say just a seismic, advance in, in how we, um, in what we can uh, offer to our patients with uveal melanoma. Um, I, I do want to start off with a few background slides just to, uh, just to remind everyone where we came from. Um, and, you know, over the past 20 years, I have to say, um, what we've been able to do um, in terms of managing, treating, and curing our patients with cutaneous melanoma has been extremely uh, just uh, awe-inspiring to me. And when I started treating patients with cutaneous melanoma, if we saw patients with metastatic disease, the conversation was, you know, we are going to do everything we can to control disease, keep you feeling as good as possible. Um, but unfortunately, outcomes were very, very poor. Um, but as you can see, starting in really 2011, there was a dramatic increase in the number of drugs that we had um, identified that were effective for patients with disease. Um, and now we have 15 approved agents or combination regimens for patients with, with cutaneous melanoma. And that has translated to our ability to cure patients even with widely metastatic disease. Um, and I think um, that progress has um, served as, I think, inspiration for a number of diseases, both within the cutaneous oncology field and outside of it. Um, you know, the, the, the challenge for the rare melanomas is that um, the advances are, are just far, far behind. And e even today, for uveal melanoma, we, we don't have any FDA-approved agents uh, for this disease. Now that's going to change uh, really soon with Dementafus. Um, again, just kind of sharing where we are. 
you know, how, how do we make these advances in cutaneous melanoma? A lot of it was due to the um, introduction of these immunologic checkpoint blockade agents, the CTLA-4 agents or PD-1, PDL one agents. Um, and, and certainly we've tried to use those agents in uvular melanoma as well. Um, but, you know, unlike in cutaneous melanoma where we can see very high rates of radiographic response, uh, long durations of response and even cures. Uh, if you look at the series and studies we've done for CTLA-4 agents like ipilimumab or tremolimumab in, uv in uvular melanoma, the response rates are, are very low. That is, we're not really able to, to meaningfully shrink tumor in a lot of cases. Um, the duration of disease control, and that's that PFS, progression-free survival number, is very short. That is, if we start treatment, uh, even if it controls the cancer, it doesn't control it for very, very long. And even with the agents like nivolumab and pembrolizumab, the anti-PD-1 antibodies, it's similar. Likelihood of major radiographic shrinkage is, is fairly modest. Um, and then the duration of disease control, that progression-free survival, also low. Um, if we combine these agents, combine ipilimumab with nivolumab in cutaneous melanoma, uh, the, the outcomes are, are very, very good. We see, we see response rates in the 40-50% range. Um, if we do that in uvular melanoma, you can see here uh, in two retrospective series and two prospective series, one led by uh, Dr. Patel, who you'll hear, hear from in a little bit, you can see that uh, response rates um, a little bit higher uh, than what we saw with the single agent studies. So we're in the, at least the double digits, um, but duration of disease control is still modest. I'd be interested to see um, uh, during the panel discussions, during the adjuvant and metastatic session, what uh, doctors Orloff and Patel um, think, but uh, you know, my take from these data is that kind of outside of clinical trials, we tend to do checkpoint blockade. I think that outcomes with combined checkpoint blockade, you know, they are numerically, numerically superior to that uh, with what we see with single agent therapy. And for me, I, I, I tend to say that therapy with combined checkpoint blockade, that is that ipilimumab and nivolumab, that aggressive immunotherapy regimen, um, should be prioritized outside of trial options for eligible patients. Um, you know, why may checkpoint blockade not work as well in uveal melanoma as it does in cutaneous melanoma? Well, there are two um, characteristics of tumors that you'll, you'll hear your oncologist talk about sometimes. And one is, um, what is the tumor mutation burden uh, within your cancer? And that is, how many mutations um, can we find in your tumor's DNA? And that's important because, as this graph shows, uh, if your tumor has a lot of mutations, and the number of mutations is here on the x-axis. So if there are a lot of mutations or tumors on this side, um, there's a higher likelihood of getting a response to immunotherapy, and that's the y-axis here. So tumors with a high number of mutations have a higher likelihood of response to immunotherapy, and that's what we see with cutaneous melanoma. Tumors with a very low mutation burden have a low response. Uh, and uveal melanoma has uh, is uh, a tumor with you know, amongst the lowest mutation burden of all cancers. Uh, this is work out of Jefferson, uh, out, out of Dr. Orloff's organization, where they looked at uh, the expression of something called PDL1 on the tumor. And PDL1, you can think of as kind of a shield that tumors surround themselves with to, to hide from the immune system. Um, if you can take that shield away with an antibody like nivolumab or pembrolizumab, that allows the immune system uh, to be effective in killing the tumor. So tumors with a lot of PDL1 um, tend to be more responsive to these PD1 uh, blockade agents. Uh, tumors with uh, just a little bit tend to be less so. And so you can see in this series of uveal melanoma samples, only 5% had uh, PDL1 expression, and that's lower than what was seen with cutaneous melanoma. And so these are some reasons why kind of the immunotherapies that we have approved now that work very well in cutaneous melanoma don't work as well in uveal. Now, that does not mean that the immune system cannot be utilized to, to treat this disease. It's just that we have to do it a little bit differently. And tabentafus is a drug that does that. Um, so this is a little bit of a, a complicated cartoon, but I'll just walk you through it. This, this here uh, represents um, the uveal melanoma cell. Uh, and this here represents an immune cell, what we call a T cell. Um, this uh, blue um, molecule here, this is what tabentafus is. And what tabentafus does is it binds very tightly to a peptide called GP100. And this is confusing, but it binds to GP100 when presented in the context of a special HLA molecule called HLA-A0201. And so basically the melanoma cell uh, will um, kind of process GP100, take a piece of it, 
attach it to this HLA molecule, and then to bentafust, the drug is able to bind to that very, very tightly. And then on the other end, it just binds to immune cells that are kind of in the area. And so you can think of this as a drug that basically um, attaches to the cancer cell and then sucks in immune cells so that they're in proximity. And that proximity by itself is sufficient for the immune cell to release all these granzymes and, and things that will ultimately kill the cancer cell. Um, the, uh, this drug has been studied in two trials for uvule melanoma. Um, one is this uh, GP100-102 trial, and the second was a phase three GP100-202 trial. And I'll just kind of walk you through this really, really quickly. Um, in the phase two trial, the 102 trial, um, patients who's, who, was, who were known to be HLA AO201 positive, um, and that's kind of that tissue type, that's, that's something that we determined by a blood test, about 40% of Caucasians um, will have this particular HLA type. And we know the drug, Tementafus, will only work if you have that certain HLA type. Uh, and so in this trial, patients who are HLA AO201 positive who had received prior therapies for their uveal melanoma were treated with tibentafus. The way tibentafus was given, it's an IV agent. It goes in over about 15 minutes, um, and we do that weekly. I'm going to go through some of the side effects of that, um, but because of some of the very reproducible side effects that occur early on when we start treatment, the first three treatments are given as an inpatient. Um, subsequently, the side effects um, tend to ta taper off and the drug can be given as an outpatient. In the second trial, uh, this was a randomized phase three trial for patients who are AO201 positive who had not received prior systemic therapy. These patients were randomized to either tibentafusp or investigator's choice where patients could receive either chemotherapy with decarbazine, uh, immunotherapy with ipilimumab, or immunotherapy with pembrolizumab. Um, this is data from the phase two trial, the first one. Um, and this is something called a waterfall plot. Each patient is represented by a bar. If the bar goes up, that means the cancer grew. If the bar goes down, it means the cancer shrunk. And what you can see here is that, you know, although 44% of patients did have some degree of tumor shrinkage, uh, when we look at the patients who had major tumor shrinkage, those that we'd really call a radiographic response, uh, it, was, it, was, it was pretty low um, in the kind of the blinded radio radiology review, the overall response rate was about 6%. But those responses sent, tended to last um, comparatively a long time, so 10 months or so. Um, but I think more importantly, despite this relatively low response rate, when we looked to see overall how the patients were doing, how long they were living, which is really the most important thing for us, for you, for everyone, um, patients were doing really, really well. And, and because of that, um, this randomized trial was conducted really to prove, to, ask, to answer the question, does Tibentafus really help people live longer when compared to what we uh, you know, normally have to offer? And so on the randomized trial, um, 252 patients received Tibentafus, 126 patients received investigator choice. And what's important here is almost all of the patients who received investigator's choice had pembrolizumab, the anti-PD-1 antibody. Okay, so this is, to me, to simplify it, this is kind of like tibentafus versus pembrolizumab, okay? The bottom line in this, and this, is, um, this was just recently reported in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, but, but uh, tibentafus was shown to have a, a significant and dramatic improvement in overall survival. Um, and this is the first drug that's ever been shown to do that. So this, this I would say, you know, seismic shift, the, the risk of dying, um, um, due to uveal melanoma was reduced by almost 50% with this treatment when compared to investigator's choice. And so kind of the takeaways from this um, really landmark study, one is that tibentafus is the first therapy to improve overall survival in metastatic uveal melanoma. We, we've never shown that before. Um, this program clearly practice changing, okay? Um, and, you know, of great interest to all of us here, when's this gonna be FDA approved? The, the latest approval date we anticipate for this in the US is gonna be in February. It might happen sooner. Um, and this is also under uh, accelerated assessment in Europe. Um, now, now again, logistically, the, the treatment is a little bit tricky. It is IV weekly. The first three doses are given basically as an inpatient. And, and that inpatient administration is because of the side effects that we see. Um, 
Um, Dr. Orloff has treated a number of patients as well, and I think can attest to this, but the, the, the side effects that we see are very uh, reproducible. And that is, you know, patients will come in, um, we'll start them on some IV fluids, they'll get treated with the Bentafuf, their first one, and about six hours later, um, it's common that patients will start to get some fevers, some chills, some sweats. A little bit later, they'll start to get a little bit of an itch. Um, their blood pressure may start to drop. And then by 24 hours or so later, the fevers have gone away, um, the chills have gone away, the itch um, and the skin uh, findings may persist a little bit. But at that point, they're, they're well enough to go home. Um, this tends to be worse during the first or second treatment, sometimes the third, um, and then the subsequent treatments um, tend to occur without those side effects happening. And so the toxicities, these side effects that we see, we do think they're consistent with kind of the mechanism of action. Um, the side effects like the fevers and the chills and the drop in blood pressure, that's due to the release of these things called cytokines. And that, that's, that happens because we're activating the immune system with this treatment and that immune activation um, is, is so robust that it leads to these um, kind of cytokine release symptoms. So this is due to overactivation of the immune system. The skin-related um, side effects like the rash and the itching, um, sometimes it's almost like a sunburn. Um, that's, that's because the drug itself is binding to GP100, which is present not just on the uveal melanoma cells, but also on your normal skin. And so that's leading to um, immune activation on the skin. So this, this just kind of shows you um, the, um, the uh, incidence of the side effects over time. And this just highlights that if you look at all side effects here at week one, nearly all patients have some side effect. Uh, whereas you know, by week four, it's down to about 70 to 80%. And by week eight, maybe it's 40% have some degree of side effects. And that continues to taper off over time. In dark blue here are what we would say the bad side effects, the side effects where we have to you know, actively do something, give, give more fluids or give some steroids. Um, and you can also see that the dark blue also decreases over time. Um, to mitigate the side effects um, and make this more tolerable, you can see that when we do dose in the beginning, the first dose is a relatively low dose, second dose is kind of an intermediate dose, and by week three, we give the full dose, which is what we maintain throughout. So this is an example of a patient who was treated on Tebentafus. Um, and this, this highlights something that's really, really important and something that we have to remember as we tr treat our patients with Tebentafus or as you re receive Tebentafus. Um, so this is a, a um, scan of the liver. Um, this is pre-treatment. You can see there's a, a spot of uveal melanoma there in the liver. So this patient got eight doses of Tebentafus and then this scan shows that that lesion grew. Um, I can say that if this were chemotherapy and I saw the scan result, I would say at this point, the treatment is not working, we have to switch. Um, with treatments like this, though, we have to be a little bit more patient um, because there's a disconnect between what we see on the scans and the ultimate benefit. Um, and eight weeks later, you can see that uh, this lesion has not changed. And in fact, over time, although it grew in the beginning, uh, it really stabilized. And this patient was on to Bentafus for over a year. Okay, so it, it, it's, it's a little bit tricky, right? Um, as we start treating patients with Tebentafus, we're gonna have to keep this in mind that the scan sometimes does not um, really tell us um, how much benefit the patient's gonna get from therapy. And so, uh, you know, question is, is there a better way for us to do that? Um, one thing we did to try to look at that uh, was look at, to look at um, a blood-based marker of tumor burden. And here we use something called circulating tumor DNA. Um, it turns out that if you, if you draw blood, uh, there are fragments of DNA from your normal cells, which we can measure, um, but we can also identify fragments of DNA that are specifically from tumor, and that can be measured. And so in the phase two trial, uh, we collected, um, we tried to collect ctDNA from patients, uh, and of the 127 patients, we were able to collect ctDNA on 99 of them. And what we found is that um, Almost all patients uh, for whom we were able to test um, had mutations in kind of the, no the known mutations we find in uveal melanoma. So these, these are things that you may have heard of like GNAQ or GNA11 or SF3B1. These are genes that are commonly mutated in uveal melanoma, and we, we were able to find those in the blood. What was interesting is over time, um, 
we saw that in many patients, um, the, the amount of that ctDNA decreased over time. And so if we compare the ctDNA at baseline um, and at week nine, um, you can see that 70% of patients had some re reduction in that ctDNA number. 14% um, of patients had complete um, disappearance of all ctDNA. And this is a little bit confusing, but what this basically tells us is that um, the uh, greater the decrease in the ctDNA, the better the patients did in terms of living longer. Okay, and so basically what this tells us is uh, the change in the ctDNA was very predictive of how the patients were going to do, not in terms of shrinking the tumor, but in terms of, of what, you know, the overall benefit in terms of survival they get from this drug. Okay, and, and so that, that's gonna be something um, that I think needs to be further developed. Um, uh, it's, it's not a standard of care um, part of how we're managing our patients now, uh, but I, you know, I, I, it, it will be in the future. So this is a scan that I've shown in the past. Some of you may have seen this before, but this is a patient um, of mine, 52 year old female, um, a GEP class two disease, um, status post-nucleation, developed metastatic disease, 26 months uh, um, later to the liver, lung, bone, and soft tissue. Um, this is a PET scan at that time. And all of these white spots are spots of cancer. Um, this is a patient I treated with ipilimumab and nivolumab, and she achieved a, a really an outstanding response. You can see that almost all of the spots went away. Um, and this is a patient that actually I was able to observe for, for a few years, actually, without further treatment. And what was striking in this case um, is that before I treated her with ipinevo, um, she had previously had ipilimumab, and the cancer grew. She had previously had pembrolizumab, an anti-PD-1 antibody with radioembolization, and then the cancer grew. Um, and then she was on tibentafusp, um, and then ultimately the cancer grew. And then I retreated her with immunotherapy with Ipi Nevo, and she had the prior Ipi, and Nevo is very much like Pembro. So she, I kind of retreated her, but with the combination. Um, and then with the combination after GP100, she achieved this really um, amazing response. And this, you know, rose, this kind of raised the hypothesis that did treatment with, with tibentafusp somehow change the tumor or the patient so that um, checkpoint blockade could work again. Um, and we went back and we tried to see, um, you know, were there other patients like this? Um, and uh, we, we went back in the entire Tibentafus um, kind of experience in 2019, and we found 28 patients um, across, um, across the Tibentafus program who received checkpoint blockade after uh, Tibentafus. Uh, and these patients, received um, uh, anti-CTLA-4 plus PD-1 or combination checkpoint blockade. And they had a, a response rate or major tumor shrinkage of um, 16%, which, which seemed kind of on par with what we see with ipinevo. Um, but the majority of these patients had had prior checkpoint blockade and it didn't work before, you know? So it just raises the question again, you know, does checkpoint blockade after tibentafus might that work better um, than a checkpoint blockade um, by itself, independent of TEBI. Um, and so, you know, as we start to use Tibentafusp in the real world as drugs approved, um, there are going to be a lot of questions that we want to answer, like, um, does that affect checkpoint blockade after TEBI? Um, and um, yesterday, uh, we, we spoke about uh, some of these important real world data efforts like vision, um, like Omni. And we're going to be collecting those data. Uh, we're going to be looking at the patients who received Tibentafus, see how they're doing, see how they're feeling, see how they're living, seeing how it's affecting their life. Uh, but we're also going to see how that affects um, their response to other therapies, um, whether given sequentially or together. So let me just kind of conclude with this. Uh, we do anticipate now having the first agent to demonstrate a survival benefit in HLA AO21 positive. Um, patients with uveal melanoma, this should be approved very, very soon. HLA typing, which we can do by blood test, should be performed at the time of metastasis for all patients. I think it should be considered for patients um, at the time of diagnosis of high-risk primary disease. Um, I think, um, and we can discuss during the panel, that tibentafus should be offered to all eligible patients, whether they're previously untreated or previously treated once it's available. 
we definitely need to do more work to understand the disconnect between the radiographic findings um, and um, true clinical benefit. And we need further work to figure out how to use the ctDNA assay. Um, we are going to look to see, or we need to see, um, can we use tibentafus in the preventative setting? Will that improve outcomes and reduce the risk of, of the cancer coming back? Um, can we combine tibentafus with other agents to make the treatment work better? Um, and I would close with there are, continue to be major, major unmet needs. This is an amazing start and I think provides a foundation for us to build further therapies and so forth. But uh, we still need treatments for our patients who are AO201 negative uh, and for patients who are resistant or refractory to tibentafus. Thank you so much, Dr. Carvajal. Um, and I know that we'll have some time for Q&A after the next session, um, where we'll bring in a broader range of um, clinical trials, but maybe just a few questions right now. And I wanna pick up on that last bullet of um, your last slide. So for patients who don't have the right HLA type, what is your advice for those patients and sort of where do you see hope for that, that group? And I think also some patients, um, and I know Greg and I um, were in this situation because he did not have the right HLA type for many therapies, um, sort of wonder why um, these drugs are being tested in a particular population. And so maybe you could explain that and then sort of what your recommendations are for patients in, who fall into that category. Yeah, so those are really, really great questions. The, you know, I guess maybe I can start off with describing what, you know, what does this HLA thing tell us? You know, it, it basically tells us how an individual immune system works, right? Like how, how does, how does my immune system kind of recognize um, foreign bodies or abnormal substances? And, and we all do it a little bit differently. Um, in, in the Western population, um, you know, there's a broad range of tissue types or HLA types, but 40% of patients are going to be HLA AO201 positive. Um, and it's, it's, to be honest, it's really just because that's the majority of the patients that when we start looking at trying to develop treatments that are HLA restricted, that's the population that we that everyone just goes for, right? It's just the broadest population. Um, it, you know, now, now that we've proved that tibentafus can work in the O201 positive patients, um, similar drugs can be developed for other HLA types, right? And, and I would say that needs to be done as well. Um, if you look at all of the guidelines, the NCCN guidelines or whatever, um, you know, Tibentafus will be listed as the um, 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 kind of prioritized choice for O2O1 positive patients. But for patients who are not, uh, it's still going to be clinical trials as a frontline um, treatment recommendation. And, and so, so I would say that clinical trials, despite this advance, clinical trials are still really, really, really important. And there are a number of very promising treatments being developed that Dr. Patel will go through. Um, access is challenging, right? You know, the number of sites that are doing these trials, it's, it's too limited. Um, but if it's possible to get access to a trial, that would be the priority. Okay, that's great. And maybe we can continue that discussion in the next session when we're talking about additional clinical trials. Um, just a couple other questions um, around Tebby. So if I um, do qualify as a patient and have correct um, HLA typing, how can I get to Bentefest right now? Can my doctor prescribe it to me? Do I need to go to a particular center? What's, what's sort of the path forward um, if I want to, um, to get on Tebby? Yeah, so Tibentafus is available on what we call an expanded access um, protocol, um, and we can get it as what we call a single patient IND. Um, the, so the processes are there. Um, uh, it, it's not super easy to get that done. Right now, the only sites that can offer those single patient INDs and expanded access protocols are the sites that have been participating in the prior TEBI trials. Um, and so what I would recommend is, and this is a little bit hard, um, but either co contacting Immunocore directly or, or um, seeing if there's a center that has participated in one of the TEBI trials near you and then um, reaching out to the doctors there to see if they're offering these programs. And um, for patients to find those centers, is if they go on clinicaltrials.gov and put into Bentefest, <clears throat> will the list of centers show up with contact information there? It will. And, and Sarah, what I can do is I can reach out. I, um, 
what, what I'll do is I'll try to reach out to Immunocore now just to see if there's a good kind of contact that we can share with patients. Okay, great. And maybe we can, if, if they're online and respond to you quickly, we can have that information in the next um, session. If not, we can um, we can promote it through through QROM channels. Okay, great. Maybe just one more question before taking a short um, break, which is um, if um, as a patient I'm on Tabentafast, how long can I stay on it? Um, and how long have you, um, you know, what's the longest that patients have been able to, to stay on it? And, and what are the reasons for taking patients off? Is it just because they're not responding or do patients take holidays? How, how does that work in terms of, you know, length of treatment um, if it is working? It's, it's, it's really, really variable. I've got, I've got patients on the original trials who've been on Tebby for years now. Um, and it, it's amazing. I mean, these guys, the worst part of their treatment is that they have to come in and see me every week, you know, which, which maybe is torture, <laughs> but I don't know. Um, but in terms of side effects, you know, there's nothing. The worst part's really just the weekly, weekly treatments. Um, you know, the question for some of these folks is, do they need continued treatment? You know, what happens if I stop? Um, I, I've, I've become, um, you know, I've taken a fairly liberal approach for some of these patients in terms of treatment breaks if they have to travel. Um, and so, right, and so I'm trying to make this fit into their life so that they're able to do the things they want to do. And so we're doing treatment breaks, sometimes three weeks, sometimes a month even, um, if, if there's something important they need to do. Um, but bottom line, if it's working, you know, I, I tend to maybe change the schedule, but I, I have been just continuing the month therapy. Great. And um, maybe one last question. I promise this is the last one, but just um, what do you foresee as um, the path forward for approval um, so that, you know, when Tebentafest um, will be available more broadly rather than just at these individual centers? Do you have anything you can tell us about that? Yeah, I, you know, this is going to be um, FDA approved in the next couple of months. Um, when it's FDA approved, anyone is going to be able to prescribe it. I think what will happen is the centers that have experience with this are probably gonna be the ones that are gonna start the patients on treatment, right? For that hospitalization course where it's a little bit more tricky. And then once they're past that tricky part, then they can go back to their local oncologist for kind of the continued maintenance therapy. Um, and I think as there's increased um, education and people become more comfortable using the drug, then it'll just be more widespread so it can be started locally as well. Great. Well, thank you so much um, for taking the time to um, give us all this information about Tebentafest. Really appreciate it. Um, and um, why don't we take about a five or six minute break now? We'll come back together at um, 11.45 Eastern time. Um, and I think we'll be able to have a little bit more of an expanded discussion and conversation. Dr. Carvajal will be back with us on a panel um, with Drs. Orloff and Patel. Um, so we will see you back here at 11.45 Eastern time. And um, thank you again so much, Dr. Carvajal. We'll see you again shortly.